just a quick uh, reminder, my name is Dirk Howard. Um, I'm the main IT person for Majestic Mountain Sage. We are a mail order supply company. So I handle all of the technology that we use. Um, I've been in the industry. I graduated from Utah State with a um, degree in computer science and I've kind of made the realm uh, or the rounds in a couple of different uh, industries. I worked at uh, a company uh, called Novell. Um, it uh, at one point was the networking leader. Um, I worked at a, another uh, satellite networking company called Helios, which uh, later merged into Hughes Networks. And I have now been with Majestic with my wife um, for the last 15 years. So, um, Why would you want to use a C library with Python? It's faster. Speed up your development might be a reason. Old code. Speed up execution and definitely keeping your environment dry. Reusing something that somebody else has uh, done rather than trying to reinvent the wheel. How does it speed up development? You're not writing uh, a system that already exists in C. Oh, Most of the time you're trying to I leverage something that already exists. I thought you meant what you were going to write. Like no, not, not necessarily. You could. Why do you want to use an existing C library? Right. David. When you answer somebody's question, will you please uh, repeat it? Repeat their question. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> sure. So, um, most of the times that I would see using a, an existing C library is because I'm trying to leverage existing code. Um, in previous uh, work experience, we had um, systems development being done primarily in C or even some C++. But then we got to a point where uh, leveraging configuration, um, um, web interfaces, uh, user interfaces, it was quicker to use some of the scripting type languages versus developing a full out Windows application or a GUI application uh, that was platform specific. So, um, some of the experience that I've had is that it makes a lot of sense to leverage what's being done at the um, C library, but moving it uh, accessible into your scripting languages. Um, you know, makes for a very quick development on um, your systems. McKelly. Uh, I'm McKay. 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 Uh, so, I'm Mackenzie and McKelly. McKay. <laughs> I'm sorry. So when you say keeping your environment dry, sorry, what, what did dry mean again? Dry means don't repeat yourself. Oh, okay. Um, That's an awful question. You shouldn't have asked that. <laughs> I answered that earlier. <laughs> There's no bad questions. No lucky like answer. So, don't repeat yourself. Don't repeat yourself. <laughs> one of the one of my friends, um, his um, motto is, "Don't write what you can steal." And so, if that means that you can find a solution that has already been done, um, you're very often further ahead by using that. Um, Often you have the issues of not only inventing it and writing it and debugging it and then all the effort to test it. 
Well, if you can find something that somebody has already done those steps on, um, you can work on more interesting problems. Uh, maybe you're going to go into this, but how much CE do you need to know in order to use the C library? Depends on which uh, solution. So, oh, so the, the question, question was, was uh, how much C do you need to know to be able to use C libraries? Um, that is going to depend on which solution. If you are using just command line interface, you probably won't need much at all. But um, we'll cover some of the um, pieces as we get into what our options are. So the three options that I'm going to take a look at, and unfortunately the, the C types, I ran out of time and um, I did not get a full C types implementation of what I wanted to demo. Um, it was uglier than what I had thought. <laughs> so I will continue to uh, work on that and I will post my code as that one is finished out. Um, one of the simplest way to leverage C code would be using the OS.system call directly out to calling a, uh, a system program or a command line program. Um, if you are just trying to get something down and dirty, you're doing it more of, I need to accomplish this and I'm not all that concerned about my execution times or how I'm going to interface the data, this is often the quickest way just to get something done in a one-off or f uh, small iteration type of situation. Let's see if I can show sleep after a while. Oh, I just need to get to the... I'm not using a camera that has a zoom either. Okay. <clears throat> this is where a screen anyway, share would have been better. Yeah, this. Um, the, the simplest way uh, to uh, call is to um, just use the um, functions to get to uh, calling a command line function. The the example that I found that I was going to demonstrate is uh, to a barcode library called Zint. It has capabilities for doing um, QR codes and uh, other 2D uh, symbologies and um, this was what I had thought about using because uh, some of the barcode libraries on um, Python are not uh, comprehensive and this Zint library seemed to be very comprehensive of all of the uh, barcode symbology that was available. So my goal was to create a um, a Python application that would 
essentially create a PNG that had um, a uh, barcode or a, uh, a QR code for a URL and that I would generate these uh, random URLs and so this one we just created this dot two PNG um, very quickly with this command line utility. Well, that's well and good, but what if you needed to pull this up from a database, generate the barcode, move it to your database, and save everything? You know um, what uh, Dupont does is what came to mind of trying to do unique uh, generations of things. Um, so if you wanted to do this once, it's no big deal. You just do it at the command line and copy and move things around. You do it a hundred times, okay, now it starts to begin to be a problem. You start doing it more like either DuPont or they do here at RR Donnelly where you're going to do it hundreds of thousands of times. Um, all of a sudden, this becomes an issue. So instead of doing it like this, we can use, uh, actually, so here I'm going to use um, the UU encode or the unique universal unique ID feature to help generate my random number um, rather than try to do anything else. So just very simply I am going to create these elements uh, of what my file name is going to be, what the URL that I'm generating and then calling out a command which is calling the Zint application. The dash B58 is saying that I want barcode type 58 which is the uh, QR code. The output file and the URL that we're encoding. And I'm just going to generate a thousand of those. So doing that, that's every hundred. Every hundred, I'm tossing this out, and I'm going to do a thousand. So I'm not too bad. We did that in nine seconds against the wall. We used system time of about two seconds. Not too bad, but you know, if you're getting into, once again, a situation where you're really cranking through things, that can quickly add up. But for the amount of effort that was put into it, it it's very workable. So, um, I put those into my out directory, we can see all of these PNGs. Any questions on just using? Can, can you go back to the code? Sure. <clears throat> what did UUID do? UUID is getting a unique oh, identifier. Okay. It, uh, oh, the question is <laughs> what did UUID do? And it is a library set to get a universal unique ID. It's used very often in uh, the database realm, especially in many of the um, 
database abstraction layers to be able to get what should be a unique ID for any particular record. It's also used in Git, G-I-T, uh, for um, putting IDs on various merge points and that. Uh, it was just mostly I didn't want to go write a, a random identity generator, so I just used that as uh, the ID. So really here in this example, the only real interesting piece is just how to use that OS system command. Everything so else is just kind of dressing. Effectively what you've done there is you've called out to the operating system to run a command with parameters. Uh, that is correct. I have just called out a command line with parameters, just a command line uh, executable. There are issues that you may need to be aware of why this is not necessarily the best way to go. If you're taking user input on things, you can leave yourself open to um, code injection. So you have to be aware of um, what your inputs are and you may have to work on sanitizing and uh, cleaning things up. Uh, also another issue is that you do have the overhead of launching up a shell each and every time that you fire this off. So um, that's going to cause a little bit of overhead. So if the runtime issues are um, a concern, this may not be the best route to go. If it's a one-off type of situation, this is very easy because you don't have to do any additional work on getting the solution put in place. It's, it is quick and dirty. <coughs> so. so the next option we have is C-types. And C-types initially was looking to me like, oh, this is going to be very straightforward, so I kind of put it off to my last, and that was a wrong as assumption to be made. Let me just show you a little bit on what I found with the C types and why all of a sudden it became uh, a nightmare. C types um, looks fairly straightforward as far as you know getting things ready and into the environment and you can oops right up here here's where I have uh, made a, a pointer into the library that I want to call so at this point I have uh, all of the library symbols are accessible through uh, this PZ dot and then the symbol name. So that was all well and good and I get started trying to go through things and the first thing that I was trying to do was just use this Z barcode create which returns a um, a symbol. Well, I quickly found out that um, what should be, you know, relatively straightforward of I now have a, a pointer to an object. Well, the the types that are being returned by um, the C types interface treats it all as like an integer. So 
you then have to start dereferencing what that uh, integer points to and then how to build the structures and this is going to be the one that I'm I'm going to have to do some work on how to build out the structures to uh, handle everything. So right now on this one if I were to try to run this um, I'm, I'm hitting points on uh, you know all kinds of type errors at the moment so I, I, I apologize on the C types I do not have an example for you at this point but I, I can see how if you had some very simple calling pieces um, it, uh, where you're not returning any complex structures that this could be done really quickly. Okay. So where are you getting your reference errors? The reference errors are primarily where I'm getting the reference errors is that I'm trying to um, build up a system that I can have access to the structures that uh, I should be using to call the code. Um, so, like I said, this the the C types. Um, I underestimated its complexity. David, yeah, about uh, five years ago, I did a whole bunch of work uh, connecting to a uh, um, a camera, um, like a vision camera, where all I had available to me was the compiled C libraries hit that camera. If you're interested I can email you that code because it's functioning C types code that does exactly what you're talking about where you have to specify like arguments going in and then getting your response and basically typecasting that mm -hmm. to, yeah, would... to, to C type pointers and things like that, dereferencing those if you're in, if that helps you at all. Yeah I would be interested. Okay. It'll, it'll probably save me a great deal of time. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll email that to you. Okay. So, I have work to do on C types. It C types would be a great way to handle something if all you had was just the library and you've kind of gone through it to um, reverse engineer access into a library. If you have access to um, the C code or at least an API um, reference to the library, then I would highly recommend SWIG. SWIG is a simple wrapper and interface generator. Uh, you can find that over at um, swig.org anyway so let's take a look at the swig interface so we've got several files here and let me just go through and let's actually clean up some of this. Swig starts out with a an interface file. So if we take a look, I have created this interface file here that is going to be my access into creating um, the module or the, um, the access module for Python. Um,
So this is my test code as I would want to try to run the interface. So I just want to be able to import a module and then in using it here we have the the same pieces where I'm just creating my basic pieces of um, what I want to be generating my barcode with. Starting to set things up, one of the first things you have to do with the Zint interface is you have to create a symbol object. So here I'm just creating a barcode symbol object. I'm setting up what the barcode type is, a QR code. I'm then specifying where I want my output to go. Then it's just encode the file or encode my barcode and then output it to my storage. So pretty straightforward as far as what we'd like to see is Python code. Very straightforward, very readable. So starting out with Uh, the interface file for SWIG, you first start out by defining what the module name is that you're going to be creating. So in my case here, I wanted to create a module and I decided to call it PyZint. And then you need to specify include files for compiling to it. So I'm just including the header file for the Zint interface. And actually, and then you build up an interface system where you can start defining each and every one of the uh, components that you would use in your program. If you're using an existing library, it's very often just uh, easiest to include the uh, header file again that defines all the interfaces and let um, uh, SWIG uh, do all the heavy lifting for you. So. There we go. This is the command I'm going to use to generate the interface and it is specifying that we're going to be uh, watching all warnings that we take. Uh, it's giving it the path of where the include files are that we need to um, process and then we're telling it that we're doing a Python module. Uh, SWIG has the ability to do uh, Python, PHP, Perl, um, a lot of different um, scripting languages. So if you have, uh, you're on a development team, and you're kind of responsible for other languages to interface, uh, SWIG can give you a lot going there. So running that against our defined um, interface file, it goes and generates for us a couple of things. It generates 
this Python file for our module. And that's going to be our module definitions. So if we take a look at that, let me just Up here at the top, it gives you a big warning, don't change this unless you really know what you're doing. Uh, you are better off making the corrections that you need in your um, interface definition file rather than here. But you can see the code that it generates, um, the various attributes and error handling, um, everything that would be nice in the C-Types interface, this does all that work for you to make sure that uh, you have error checking with your system. So question? Yes. Robert. Swig auto-generate the C-Types and also adds error checking on top of that? Yes, it does. Uh, the question was, uh, does SWIG uh, generate all of your uh, C types and your error checking? Um, the, the, yes, it does generate and do a lot of things for you to make sure that um, you've got a module that is going to be robust and it's going to do error checking on your parameters and uh, make sure that everything's aligning. Robert. So why bother with C-types when you got SWIG? I wouldn't. Okay. I think the, the answer to your question, the question was why bother with C-types when you've got SWIG. What he, happened with him before and what he said was that if you have a fully compiled version of your C code, yeah, you, it's, you can't use this because you, you don't have the interface. If, if you, you were... Yeah. Okay. The, the only reasons I could see to use C-types over SWIG is that you are reverse engineering access into a library. You don't have header files and you have really just down and dirty dug into it to hook into it. Um, yeah, it, if, if that's your only solution to a problem, you know, you, you take that particular hammer out and you whack at it until it gives in. Um, if you have the ability to um, have a cleaner way to do it, uh, I, I'm all for the cleaner way. So, let's... So we've got uh, the pyzint.py, and then it also generated this pyzint uh, underscore wrap.c, and that is the the C code that is going to be necessary to um, generate uh, my module that uh, interfaces between the two. Um,
and this chunk of code is definitely a lot of C code that is uh, doing all of our um, interface pieces between Python and our C library. Uh, it's a, a relatively large piece and you know, here we're what 75, 7600 lines, almost 77. So once you've generated those, you can actually go through and compile up um, the modules and build up your library to call from um, uh, Python. But one of the nice things about um, Swig is that it also understands the Python disk utils. So we have here uh, a module or uh, a setup for a Python module. And it, how many of you have ever written a Python module? Have you, has anybody here used the disk util setup before? Okay. I would love to know what they're for. <laughs> I keep seeing them reference, but the disk util uh, system is a mechanism that allows you to gather up all the components for your Python module and be able to transfer that to another computer and set up the um, environment to uh, build it and install it into somebody else's system. Um, if you looked at any of the Python modules that you get through um, pip, through pip install, if you go into and take a look at it, it's going to have a setup.py um, component to it, and it's going to have some of these elements to it. So it's going to describe um, here, uh, we've got the setup, what the name of the module is, um, its version, description, and then it's got uh, some other pieces for the module um, library or um, the code section for it. So using this, it will actually build my system from the source code that I have, which was the wrapper that was generated. And then we also have the uh, pyzint.py. So between the pyzint.py and the pyzint wrap, these are the two components we need to um, be able to put together. The, the uh, the Pyzint wrap is going to uh, combine with the, um, during the generation of the executables uh, to provide everything that needs to access the system library for the Zint. And it also, uh, the Python components to define the library, or the, the interface. So we've kind of get both of these wrapped up all in one. So making these, I've gone through and it's compiled and built up my executable or my library. So I now have this underscore pyzint.so. Um, if I were on a Windows system, I would have a DLL for um, my executable. So at this point, I have um, everything ready to um, start testing. Um, 
Another way that you would normally have seen uh, the disk utils would be like uh, Python setup, and you can do help commands, and this gives you um, what uh, the disk utils would be doing for you. So if you look at um, my make file, um, essentially what I am doing here is I'm just calling the uh, Python setup and I'm telling it to build my extension. So at this point I've got everything necessary in this directory to uh, run my uh, test. Here is a type of gotcha that you might find in doing this. In here in our Z barcode in code, argument two is of type unsigned char star. Well, let's go take a look at what we were trying to do with that encode function. So here on my encode, in my second argument, I'm passing in my URL. Well, that's a string. Well, if you dig into the um, SWIG documentation, the normal convention for passing a string into a C library is char star, not an unsigned char star. So here we've got a small fix up that we need to do for a type incompatibility between how Python is expecting to hand things off and how my library is expecting to uh, get things in. So we need to bring up our interface and what I have here is I need to include a type def or a character or a, um, a type um, clarification or kind of a type casting. So I actually have so I've got this type map now let's try that again I can type so we're going to set up this type map that is type mapping unsigned char to behave like the previous char star. Mm -hmm. So if we save that, come out here and we'll make our system again. Now we go back and do our Python test. Apparently I didn't have any outputs on this. There's my collection of PNG files. So yeah, I didn't uh, put in my loop print, so let's just do that real quick.
So now we get to see something happen. And let's see what we had um, as far as um, time. Anybody remember what we got on the... Nine seconds. Okay. Very good, wall. David. Nine on the wall, what he said. Nine on the wall. I'd never heard that phrase before. So here, real time is just a little under four seconds. Uh, clock, system clock. So we got a, a pretty good performance boost against the system time. We didn't use as much system time as we did previously, and we uh, cut our uh, wall time in half. And this is, once again, no real optimization has been done here for either our Python code or uh, trying to uh, better utilize the system. But you can quickly see that if it's something that you're going to be doing over and over and over again, um, the SWIG interface gives you a lot of bang for uh, your work. And as we saw earlier, we actually got some meaningful error messages out of it as well. Uh, so my takeaway is that if it's down and dirty and you're not trying to um, do anything really fancy, uh, OS system is a great way to just get something done. But if you're looking at incorporating code that is going to be used over and over again and performance is starting to become an issue, um, but you still also want to have um, full accessibility to the API, uh, SWIG is worth learning how to do. Okay, with the API, um, you need access to the H files that came with the API. Yes, you to to um, to use Swig, you do need to uh, have either access to the API files itself, or you can build up everything in that interface file. So if you've gone through the work of reverse engineering, you could probably also build a Swig interface to it. Um, so that's to say that you can't go straight off of a DLL in a Windows box. You'd have to get to the source. You'd have that source available. I'm. The, the question is whether you could go straight against a DLL in a Windows box. Um, not simply. Uh, if you're willing to do some work mm -hmm. to reverse engineer it, you know, if you can dump the symbols on any DLL. And if you have uh, some uh, vague notion of its uh, calling um, structure, you could probably reverse engineer it. But if you have um, actual uh, header files uh, for it, uh, then you don't have to guess on types and parameters and return values. Robert? I was just going to mention, have you, are you familiar with PyWin? No. Okay. It's basically somebody's, they assume that you know all of the standard, you know, C-level Windows mm -hmm. libraries. Yeah. That's great if you ever have to deal with Windows on a C-level. So, you just pie win, look it up. Uh, it has very little documentation. Microsoft, the Microsoft site would be your best documentation there. Now, let me give you kind of one uh, caveat on this entire presentation. Quite honestly, I had to really dig around to find a library that was interesting that hadn't already been implemented on Python. So um, I, the only times I really see this being uh, an issue is when you've either got some very weird piece of hardware that nobody else is using except for you know three people in your company uh, and you're trying to leverage up uh, the code of 
some old time C programmer. Um, and it happens. What I'm thinking of primarily is SDKs they come from big corporates folks, they will, they very often will not, and mostly will not have the bike. Yeah, it, and, and um, Louis's point is, is that if you've got uh, some kind of SDK for um, a particular piece of software, um, for example, recently in our company, we were dealing with um, a software package that handles, um, um, safety data sheets and uh, it's a very specific piece of software and um, they have a very particular way of interfacing. If you've got something like that building up a Python interface on your own, if they've provided an API to access it, uh, you can do that even if they haven't had any interest in doing it themselves for their Tools. But uh, if you're looking at most of the interesting um, libraries out in the open source community, uh, Python seems to be one of the first language scripting languages that most um, interesting uh, projects build for people. Any questions? So I know there's a C implementation of Python called Cython. How, uh, how would the speed increases in that compared to using the, the C libraries? I don't know what's, I, I uh, um, he's asking the question of um, how Cython um, speed would compare. And I don't know what the focus of Cython is. I don't know what problem it's trying to solve. Um, does anybody know Cython at all? So, so I think the default Python you get is actually built on the C uh, Python implementation. There's some that are like um, actually like bootstrap by Python. So instead of the actual interpreter being written in C, it's written in Python. And that was supposed to be actually a lot faster. I was actually going to ask you if you knew if Swig was compatible with some of those implementations. I don't know. I would, I would imagine that if uh, Disk Utils works with those other Python implementations, that uh, you should be. Uh, pretty good shape to go forward with it. Robert? Um, alternative, I'm not sure if this is Cython or a different project, but there are projects where it basically it is a Python syntax on C. And so you have to add, add a few additional things to your Python code to say, this is an end or this, you know, whatever type it is. You can't go without types in C. Um, and that basically compiles to C code. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Swig is not a way to build um, a Python interpreter into a C program. It's a way to interface a C library to Python scripting. So um, just kind of keep that. So, so actually there is a Cython and then there's C Python. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah, there you go. So that's, that's confusing. So what's the difference between the two? Oh, uh, there's a stack of flow. I was just reading it. Let's see. <laughs> oh, it's really. Um, so, Cython and PyPy. PyPy is the one that's all Python. Right. So it's Python. It's way fast. Yeah, they're supposed to be uh, a lot faster. And C Python's. C Python's just the one so that it's like just the Python. Yeah, it's just Python. So C Python is in the same realm as you got, I guess, J Python. It's like Python running on the job into a C Python C platform for running. Java. Hired Pythons if you're doing the .NET platform. What was that last one? Iron Python. <laughs> I hadn't heard of that one. Yeah. Microsoft has a bunch of Iron, they got like Iron Ruby and you know, others, and they all run on .NET. 
Any other questions? Okay. Nat.